welcome to The Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Our topic tonight is the arrival of the Antichrist. Our speaker tonight is uniquely qualified in that he was raised in an Illuminati family for 20 years. He's also a seventh generation witch. He attained the degree, third degree witch. And for the last 18 years, he's been speaking out on it since he met Jesus. Will you help me welcome Doc Markey? As usual, the one thing I'm praying for is that I'm able to put all this material in the time that I've been allotted. So far, I haven't succeeded once. So if I start moving faster than light, it's only because I'm trying to get all this material in on time. And I'm praying that the camera people will bear with me because I'll be going back and forth to the screen constantly. Now, one of the most common questions people ask me is, how did I get in this mess to begin with? It wasn't my choice. I was raised in an, Illum in an Illuminati family. When I was three years old, this is where they brought me to a special ceremony in which I was dedicated to the cause of Lucifer. Now, this is not unusual because in other religions, you will see people bringing their children to their churches, their synagogues, wherever, to have them dedicated to God. In the occult world, they dedicate their ch um, children to Lucifer or to Satan, depending on which branch of the occult you're from. In my case, it was to Lucifer. For the next 10 years, I remained in what's known as the outer court. Now, this is best understood as the Illuminati's seminary training ground. This is where you're learning all um, the religious beliefs, the practices, the rites, the rituals, different spells, incantations, the eight nights of human sacrifice, all the Sabbaths, the Yetzbats, so on and so forth. So by the time I was 13 years old, I was fully initiated as a member of the Illuminati. Towards the end of the ceremony, what they did, they brought forth a book that was made out of lamb's hide. They took a ceremonial knife called athame and they cut my arm wide open. I was passed a quilled feather and I had to dip it in my own blood and sign my occult name in this book. This book is, an, is known as the Book of the Dead, as opposed to what the Christian Bible calls what we have as the Lamb's Book of Life. If you're going to understand the occult, understand it in this way. Everything is based upon a reversal or a counterfeit principle straight from the scriptures. To this very day, Satan has never had an original idea and let me tell you, he never will. I'm allergic to podiums. I'm afraid that God may decide to call me to be a preacher. <laughs> so I stay as far away from them as possible. And in this case, when I have to stand behind them, I will stray as much as possible. So for um, the next four years, I was learning the ins and outs of the Illuminati, just like anyone else in there. Except in my case, I also had 169 years with a family history that I was also learning. So by the time I was 17, this is when I was initiated as a third level witch. Generically speaking, it's known as a master witch or what's properly known as a high druid priest. This gave me automatic authority over, re over a region. Now, a region is the governing area in which an Illuminati has full authority over. In this particular region, we had over a thousand Illuminists within it. A year later, under orders from my bosses, and I'm going to tell you right now, I was under orders. This was not my decision. I joined the United States Army. There was an ongoing plan since the mid-60s in which the Illuminati were infiltrating military bases throughout the world. The reason they were doing this is because they wanted to gain access and control over all the forts throughout the world. Now, if you can gain access, of course, to these soldiers, let's say you set up a coven at a particular base. You recruit the people from communications, from supply, wherever. If these people are in, and they're one of you, well, because they're one of you, you have access to what they have access to. And we're talking about some very high-level secrets now. But because they were one of us, they would just bring all this stuff over to us upon demand. 
Now, when I was in Fort Lewis, Washington, this is where I first started my first coven, if you would. This was Fort Lewis, Washington. About two weeks after I got there, I had easily 20 people already recruited. Now, a couple of months into this, we already had at least 100 people at that point. I was basically walking down the street minding my own business when this associate stopped me. It wasn't anyone I really knew too well. It was just someone I have happened to have bumped into every now and then. At the end of the conversation, he asked me what I thought was, what a, was a very ridiculous question. Would you like to go to church with me on Sunday? Now remember, this person was an Illuminati witch. We practice the rites of human sacrifice eight times a year. We stay in constant communication with demons. And he asked me, would I like to go to church with him on Sunday? Well, I can't pe repeat exactly what I said I, um, because of decency, but um, back then you can only imagine the way I said no. But I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the truth is for the next three years, it was hell on earth. Because no matter where I went, no matter how far I went, and I went far, some born-again Christian had my name. I mean, they were falling out of trees, they were jumping out of bushes, and I know I saw a couple jump out of a couple of vehicles once, and they were moving. <laughs> and it was non-stop. It was like this for three years. I mean, it was eventually to where I was getting paranoid and I was looking on, you know, over my back, you know, in the mirror, seeing if someone put up one of those funny signs, get this person saved, he's a witch. You know? And because of time, I'm going to um, abbreviate this, but um, at the end of those three very long years, I saw what I was doing in light of what the Christians were telling me. So on April 15th, 1979, which happened to have been Resurrection Sunday then, I walked into a Christian church and I admitted I was a sold out slave of Satan. But God be praised, for almost 18 years I've been a born again child of the King. And that's when my life really became interesting. Um, shortly afterwards, I decided to go to Louisiana Baptist University, Shreveport, where I wanted to get my Christian education. When I was in the military, I did get, you know, my um, college degree. But right now, I figured it's about time I go into the Christian world, get my Christian education, see what this was all about. This was only about maybe a year and a half after I was saved, something like that. Poor Jim Thorpe. That was the chancellor of my university. And um, I gave that man every gray hair he has to this very day. I did, I admit it. I mean, he had it coming to him anyways. Oh, he did, honest, because the first thing he did, on the very first day he met me, he said, young man, I have two lists. One of them is a president's list. You get a 3.50 average and above, you'll be on that list. You get on my nerves, You'll be on my hit list. I looked him dead in the eye and said, and I'm going to be on both of them. And I was. And um, to this very day, I think whenever I get anywhere near the university, Jimmy just gets another gray hair. Now, as I was saying before, I have a lot of material I am literally going to be flying through. Lord willing, I'll be able to get through this in time. Now, if any of you have studied the history of the Illuminati, you're going to recognize this gentleman immediately. This man is Dr. Adam Weishaupt. He was the f very first head of the Order of the Illuminati. Back in 1773, when he held the chair of the professorship of Jewish canon law at the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria, Germany, he was approached by Maya Amschel Bauer and 12 of his most financially influential friends, which makes up your first coven of 13, if you would. And they basically approached this man and said, listen, you've got the occult knowledge and the genius who put it all together. We've got the money. You do it, we'll back it. This is just paraphrasing the whole thing. But basically, three years later, on May 1st, 1776, Dr. Adam Weishaupt had succeeded in culminating the plans 
of the Illuminati, their complete organizational structure, the belief, the whole thing. This man was considered an expert in most of the occult schools of his day and age. Now, we're going to be getting into this part of it later, but the idea of Illuminism did not begin with this man. It can actually be traced all the way back to Babylon around 3500 BC. We will be getting into this. The gentleman underneath Dr. Weishaupt is Baron Adolf von Knigg. It was through this man's brilliancy that the Illuminati really began to flourish. 2,000 of the most powerful, influential people in Germany joined the order of the Illuminati in a matter of years because of this man. We are talking about these people, they had three things in common. They had wealth, they had power, and they had letters. That is to say, they were intellectuals. Now think about this for a second. Could you imagine what we could do right now as, as a um, Christian people if we could gather the 2,000 wealthiest people in America? What could we do for Christ then? Literally, we would do what the apostles did and turn the world upside down. How many people recognize this familiar symbol? Okay. If you people would be good enough, please take a dollar bill out because we're going to be going through this. Where's the water? Okay, if everyone has their dollar bill out, you'll please follow me, follow along. You will notice on your dollar bill, this seal will appear on the left-hand side. Okay, you will notice at the very top of the pyramid, a 13-letter expression, and directly beneath it, another one. This is, in Latin, it says, annuit corruptus novus ordo seclorum, which means announcing the birth of a new world order. This new world order, now if you look at the bottom of the pyramid in Roman numerals, it says MDCCLXXVI. This is um, 1776, but we are not talking about July 4th. We are talking about May 1st, 1776, the very day in which the Illuminati was officiated. I will be able to show this part of it to you afterwards as far as the proof that this is indeed May 1st. You will notice the pyramid itself is made up of 13 levels. Now, how many, now, I'm sure many of us have heard of numerology before. This is where you take numbers and assign them to letters, correct? You will notice there's another system in the occult that's known as gematria. Gematria will give you the definition to those numbers. In other words, 6 is the number for man, um, 36 is the number for the enemy, 16 is the number for love, and I'm sure we all know what the number 666 means, correct? Right. Going back to the seal, again, there are 13 levels to it. 13 in gematria is the number for depravity and rebellion you'll notice that the pyramid itself is easily discerned to be a three-dimensional object. You can tell by this and over here, it has four sides. When you look at the capstone, however, you can't tell that at all. It just remains to be just a triangle and nothing more. That's because in the occult, those three sides represent the false prophet, the beast, and the antichrist. You will notice we are led to believe that that is supposed to be the all-seeing eye of God. If it were, in symbology, that capstone's in the wrong position. It would have to be coming down the point, which would be God looking into the affairs of man. In the reverse position as it is right now, it's man invading the heavenlies. That is the all-seeing eye of Lucifer. Even though he thinks he's all-seeing, he isn't. In short, what this entire seal is saying is that on May 1st, 1776, a new world order had come about. It would be based on depravity and rebellion and headed by Lucifer. 
Now, if you will take a look to the right-hand side of your dollar bill, you will notice the all-familiar eagle, correct? You will notice that there are 13 stars, a 13-letter banner, um, the eagles holding the banner, the breastplate, the arrows, tail feathers, and the olive branch. Now, I'm going to switch to a black and white one because the breastplate especially breaks up into a certain um, pattern that you need to take a good look at. Starting at the very top, you will notice the cluster of 13 stars. Surrounding those 13 stars are 28 guidelines. 28 in gematria stands for eternity, or that which is eternal. Directly beneath those 13 stars, you will notice the eagle is holding a 13-letter banner. The banner in Latin says E Pluribus Unum. Translated, E Pluribus Unum means one out of many. But the question is, one out of many what? When Dr. Adam Weishaupt was formulating the Illuminati, he was infiltrating the Masons, the Jesuits, the Rosicrucians, and other occult schools of his day and age. What he was doing was taking the best and the brightest minds out of these organizations and bringing them into his own. What he was doing was forming one group out of many group. This is what that is talking to. You will notice the eagle is looking to the right. Whenever the bird, symbolically speaking, looks to the right, it's looking on in favor of whatever it's looking towards. Compare, compare this to the Nazi war bird of World War II where it was looking to the left, away in opposition. In other words, it was not looking on in favor. An eagle bird, correct? Most people have never seen the original seal that was accepted by Congress in 1782. This seal, which bears um, the eagle, was only designed like that back in 1933. In other words, that was the first time the eagle itself appeared on the seal. I'm going to show you the original one, and then you try to tell me what it looks like. The Egyptian phoenix, correct. According to Egyptian mythology, the phoenix bird itself would live for about four to five hundred years Afterwards, it would come down upon the face of the earth and be consumed in its own fire. Out of the ashes, an egg would be left behind, and out of that egg, a new phoenix bird would emerge. This would complete the cycle of reincarnation. This particular um, eagle is not what we call a perfect one because the wings have 32 feathers and one has 33. This is because they represent the two factors of masonry. One um, factor, the York Rite has 32 degrees, the thir and the um, Scottish Rite has 33 degrees. We're going to get into the masons and how they've been fooled. And literally 95% of all masons do not realize that they've been victimized. You will notice a very unusual breastplate upon the eagle. There are 12 horizontal lines and 18 vertical lines. 12 in gematria is the number for governmental perfection. 18 is the number for bondage. But, it was, but what is more interesting is that these 18 lines are broken down into six sections, making the white field into seven. Six is the number for man, seven is the number for God. What they are literally doing is putting man above God. You will notice the eagle has eight talons or claws in that they are clenched. Eight is the number for new beginnings, but once again, they are clenched. Symbolically speaking, something's being taken away. If something was being given, they would be open. The olive branch on the left-hand side has 13 leaves and 13 berries. Over here, we have 13 arrows. The olive branch itself represents peace, and the berries represents the fruit of that peace. The arrows represent our military might and our ability to defend ourselves. 
But notice how they're being taken away. Tail feathers have always been used for guidance and stability. We all know this. Nine tail feathers. Nine is the number for completion of that which is finished. What this seal is saying in light of the other seal is that this new world order is going to be eternally crowned with depravity and rebellion, having formed itself out of many groups. Through reincarnation, this new group has emerged as a perfect government and holding us in bondage. This new government will place man above God, taking away our peace and our ability to defend ourselves, and that it is now complete. But it doesn't stop there. We're just scratching the tip of the iceberg right now. If you notice very carefully, can we see the difference between the phoenix and the eagle? I think once we take a good look at them side by side or on top of each other, we see an obvious difference. One of the most foulest, there's um, no sign more evil than this particular symbol. But if you look at the bottom symbol right here, this particular sim symbol is known as a hexagram. It has six points to it, and it has a circle around with it. In order for anyone in their cult to summon up a demon, and I mean a literal demon, to this plane of existence, they must use that symbol. That has to be used. Now this is not to be confused with this symbol up here. That is commonly referred to as the Seal of Solomon, the Mogan David, or the Seal of David. You will notice it is two equilateral triangles that are interwoven. This shows the union of man with God. This particular symbol, the hexagram, takes an um, equilateral triangle and puts it on top of another. This is placing man above God. Again, it's just a lousy counterfeit. We know that according to Revelation 13, 18, that the number of the beast is 666, correct? A hexagram has six points to it. Three of them would constitute a six, a six, a six, correct? Now, have any of you ever wondered why there are so many 13s on the dollar bill? Now, I know the most commonly um, response is that it represents the 13 colonies. Well, why so many 13s? That's a little bit redundant. We have 13 signs, we have banners and letters that make up 13, 13 leaves on the berries, 13 arrows. Why so many 13s? I'm going to show you the seal that has the eagle on it. I think we're going to begin to get the picture once you look at this very first one. Look at the very top of the eagle. You will notice there is a hexagram sitting right above it. You can look as close as you wish on your dollar bill. These are simple laser blow-ups. This is a known, defined geometric symbol. It is known as a hexagram because geometry has assigned the meaning to its shape. You'll notice there was a star inside each of the points, and the 28 guidelines form the circle. Your first six. Here is why there are so many 13s on the dollar bill. If we play connect the dots, the hexagram once again is shown. 13 stars, and you follow the outline now of the star itself, straight down to the 13 arrows, to the 13 olive branch, and they connect, straight through and across the stars through the 13 um, lettered banner. Six and seven here makes 13. Notice, this, notice a point right down here where you're supposed to connect it. And if you notice, the seal already comes with a circle. Now, if my premise is correct, there has to be a third six somewhere. And if you look towards the other seal, 
you will find the other hexagram. Once again, all we have to do is just connect the 13. So the 13 steps, the 13 letter banner, which if you notice goes directly underneath the capstone and connects down here. And it comes with a circle. So we have three sixes. But it doesn't stop here. I'm going to get into another section, and as I do, we will be referring back to this particular symbol. I will um, lay a foundation first, and then you will see something other with this symbol you would never have guessed. But then again, you're not supposed to know any of this. These are among what we're going to be discussing and showing tonight. Among the top 1% of those secrets the Illuminati do not want you to know about. Because if you were educated as to what was really going on, you would really begin to start doing something about it. And it's unfortunate that America itself is purposely being educated into stupidity. It's for this reason that one out of ten graduating seniors cannot even read his own diploma. And it's for this reason that one out of five American parents cannot even read um, a bedtime story to their own children. The gentleman at the top of the screen is General Albert Pike. He was the head of the southern um, jurisdiction of Freemasonry back in the 1800s. The gentleman on the bottom is Giuseppe Manzini. That man on the bottom was the second head of the Order of the Illuminati. He came into power in 1834, years after Dr. Adam Weishaupt had died. He was placed in his position by the Rothschilds. This man was another occult genius. Albert Pike himself was really a true genius in all definition. He could read, write, and fluently speak 16 ancient languages. He is also responsible for writing what is considered a classic in the Masonic world. That book is known as Morals and Dogmas. It is 861 pages worth of occult literature. I'll tell you right now, if it wasn't for the fact that I was in the Illuminati for 20 years and now I've been out for almost 18, if it wasn't for all those years, I would never be able to open that book and read it. It takes that much in-depth occult training to understand what the book is really saying. In that particular book, let me tell you right now, there are two versions of it. There's what's known as the exoteric and then there's what's known as the esoteric. The exoteric book, anyone is allowed to pick up. Now the esoteric book, which is E-S-O, as opposed to E-X-O, the esoteric one, when you open the book up, it will say that this is the esoteric version of Morals and Dogmas, and upon the death of the recipient, the book is supposed to be turned back to the lodge. I still have mine. Oh, I'll return it eventually. But um, in the back of the book, they have a particular glossary. This glossary must be almost 200 years old, if I, um, excuse me, 200 pages long. I can do with that glossary what no, in just a couple of days what no one could do in a couple of months. This is why it's the esoteric version. You can look up um, the Illuminati in it, Satan, Lucifer being God, and all that. All you have to do is just check the glossary. It'll be there by subject matter, and it'll tell you where to find it. How many people know this map? This is the original map of 1790 of Washington, D.C. And when I look at some of these old materials, I really get a laugh. I mean, you notice over here, someone couldn't spell Potomac correctly, so they had to cross out the W. 
up here, someone accidentally put the Congressional House where the Capitol was, was supposed to be. It's going to be somewhere around here. So they just crossed that out and scratched in Capitol. Even back then, just as today, they were having educational problems. I'm going to take a, tu a regular tourist map, and I'm going to show you something very interesting. You will notice, and I, and I was only able to do part of it, I could have done the whole thing, but you will notice that Washington, D.C. is laid out in an occult symbolic pattern. These are all symbols that can be found in the occult world. The set over here are from the Masonic occult religion. The ones over there is from the Illuminati one. Now, if you notice this one in particular, looks like a satanic stick figure, doesn't it? And it's a good thing it's made up of um, streets, because this is, this is about the best I could draw anyways. All these are, where these lines are, are nothing but roads. And they connect to certain monuments. Over here is the Jefferson Memorial, the White House, the Washington Monument, the Capitol, where the left horn is would be um, the Supreme Court. On the right-hand side would be the Library of Congress. But if you notice, those are roads. Why would someone accidentally make roads that look like horns? This particular symbol itself, this satanic stick figure, is made up of three of the four most holiest of all symbols in the occult world. Where the arms come down and go up, that is known as a square in the Masonic world. You notice where the circle is and it comes down to what looks like legs. That's a compass. We all know what a compass is used for. And where the line is broken up, why it broke it up, this is what's known as the measure. But again, notice how it forms this satanic stick figure. And it goes straight through, mind you, one of the most powerful streets, politically speaking, in the world. This section is known as the mall. Now, when we look at the other figure, I'm sure we've all seen the inverted five-pointed star before. Notice how the compass comes right over here to the White House, and the inverted pentalpha, or what's known as a goat head of Me uh, Mendes, or the mezzanine goat head, converges at the White House also. It connects from Mount Vernon to Logan Circle, to DuPont Circle, to Washington Circle, and just meets right back here. And if all you have to do is, again, just connect the roads, and it makes a symbol. This shows the unionization of the Masonic world with the Illuminati one. You will notice that square green um, block up there. That place is what's known as the House of the Temple. If you wish to become a 33rd degree Mason, or what's known as a Sovereign Grand Instructor General, you have to go there to have it performed. That is the headquarters for Masonry worldwide. And it's no coincidence that from the White House, all the way up to the house of the temple, it's exactly 13 city blocks. Funny how this number keeps repeating itself. Now just to show you this will work with any tourist map, I have another one here that I'd like you to take a look at. It's nothing special. Once again, it's just a regular tourist map. Again, the Capitol, here is Pennsylvania Avenue, Maryland Avenue, the White House, Thomas Jefferson Memorial, the Mall, the Washington Monument, the House of the Temple, and if you notice, the um, Goat Head of Mendes again, both converging at the White House. Now, a lot of people have asked me, how long has this been going on? In other words, how long 
have the Illuminati place their seat of power in America? How long has it been here? When we take a look once again at the original map of Washington, D.C., you will notice the symbols are right there. This is the map of 1790. You will notice the Masonic symbols, which make up the satanic um, figure, the inverted pentalpha, and 13 blocks away already from the White House to the House of the Temple, 13 city blocks. It was already there. When they first designed Washington, D.C., they had laid it out to where it would form these occult patterns. I think by now it becomes apparent that this can't be an accident, especially when we consider that these are known occult symbols. Now, one last piece of proof I would like to demonstrate to you before we get into this even deeper. If you recall, the pyramid that's on the back of the dollar bill, correct? Starting at the base of the pyramid, the foundation, this is where all things begin. You will notice the only letter this symbol is touched, uh, I should say runs through, the only letter through here is the M. Over here, you will notice that the only letter or number that is outside of it is the one, correct? Well, that's why it's May 1st 1776. But it goes further than that. The only letter that this goes through is the M. We will start at the foundation, which is the beginning of all things. From the M, the symbol goes all the way up to... It cuts over underneath the capstone to... It cuts straight down, goes between these letters, and cuts down to... Now, it cuts up, and it's difficult to see in black and white, but it cuts over the symbol to the... What does M-A-S-O-N spell? Could it be an accident? I don't think after everything we've already seen, it could be, especially when it's spelling Mason out perfectly in perfect order, M-A-S-O-N. By this time, I think it's, I think we would have to say to ourselves, it's impossible that it's an accident. Going into the Masons themselves, in order to understand the true occult nature of their system, what we're going to do is go, is go through their own books. Throughout the last 18 years, some of the most commonly asked questions I've been asked is what we're going to go over right now. One of those questions people usually ask me, is Freemasonry or the Masons, are they a Christian organization? According to Albert G. Mackey in his Encyclopedia of Freemasonry on page 182, now this man was a 33rd degree Mason, he states, if Freemasonry was simply a Christian institution, the Jew and the Muslim, the Brahmin and Buddhist, could not consciously partake of its illumination. Well then, is a Christian? Freemasonry is not Christian, nor a substitute for it. Now if any of you have been inside Masonic Temple, you will notice that they have the King James Version of the Holy Scriptures sitting on their altar, which is towards the east. You would think this would be proof, or some proof, that they're um, into um, something godly. According to the Digest of Masonic Lodge, uh, Law, it states, Masonry has nothing to do with the Bible. It is not founded upon the Bible. For if it were, it would not be masonry, it would be something else. Well, so then, it's not a Christian organization. They don't um, have a um, Christ-centered religion and they don't believe in the Bible. Well, then what about God? 
According to J.D. Buck, in his book Mystic Masonry, he states, Humanity in total, then, is the only personal God. Now, isn't this what the New Age religion is telling us? You are a God unto yourself. I mean, Shirley MacLaine, John Denver, and um, this is a very old lie, people. It is the oldest of all lies that was given to mankind. If you remember, when Adam and Eve was in the Garden of Eden and Satan in the guise of a serpent approached Eve, he said, if you will eat of this forbidden fruit, ye shall be as gods. It is the same old lie, ladies and gentlemen. It's just a different package. And that's it. So since the Masons do not um, hold to Christ, the Christian religion, to God, or anything like that, then they can't be teaching a religion, correct? Or at least this is what we've been led to believe. Listen to this. Every Masonic Lodge is a temple of religion, and its teachings are instructions in religion. This is from Albert Pike's classic book, Moral and Dogmas, on page 213. Since they are a religious temple, what are they searching for if they're not looking for Jesus Christ? Like we here in this particular church building, this is who we're looking after, is our Lord and risen Savior. Question is, who are they looking for then? Freemasonry is a search after light. That search leads us directly back, as you see, to the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is a very ancient occult symbol in which you take Hebrew letters from their alphabet, and if you arrange them in a certain pattern, not only can you formulate and cast spells through it, but you can also glean the hidden mind of God. Imagine that. Just by arranging a couple of letters, you can actually gain hidden knowledge from God's mind. This is basically what the Kabbalah is about. But isn't the Kabbalah a religion, though? Once again, according to Albert Pike's book, Moral and Dogmas, all truly dogmatic religions have issued from the Kabbalah and returned to it. Everything scientific and grand in the religious dreams of all the Illuminati. And so many Masons tell me that the, um, the, um, their, own, their lodges have nothing to do with the Illuminati. So then, since we know that the Kabbalah is an ancient occult religion, and since it's being used in the Masonic religion, are any of their occult symbols can they be identified as normal symbols, shall I say, within the occult realm? In other words, are we looking at a pattern here, a similarity? According to one particular occult book in my library, it's called The Secrets of Ancient Witchcraft. It was written by Arnold and Patricia Crowther. This is what they state. In modern witch rites, we find terms and expressions that are also used in masonry, the golden dawn, and other such occult societies. Now these witches, in other words, are pointing to the, to the Masons and saying they are an occult society. Now when you think about it, who better than an occultist to point out who the other occultists are? You would then think that if the Masons are indeed an occult organization with an occult religion, surely many noted or famous occultists must, be, must have belonged to it or belonged to it. And I'm going to show you some interesting examples of Masons who are also known practicing occultists or witches or Satanists. This gentleman here is Arthur Edward Wade. He was an occult writer and historian, 
and he was also responsible for creating a particular type of tarot deck. This tarot deck is known as the Weight Rider Tarot Deck. It's one of the most commonly used, if not one of the most popularized, version of a tarot deck. This is Dr. Wynne Westcott. He was a member of the Rosicrucian Society and he was a founding member of the Occult Order of the Golden Dawn. But like the gentleman before him, he was also a Mason. S. L. McGregor Mathers. He was the other co-founder of the Occult Order of the Golden Dawn and he too was a Mason. You know this next one has stumped more people than I know what to do with. I thought this would be one of the most commonly recognized ones. Does anyone know who this gentleman is? Alistair Crowley. Now the name sounds familiar to everyone. They recognize. Here is old Alistair Crowley, commonly referred to by his own mother as the beast of the book of Revelation. He was that foul and debased a person. His contemporaries, other occultists, referred to him as uh, Mr. 666. And there he is in all his Masonic glory. Here is Alistair Crowley once again in one of his occult meetings. He had an order that was known as the Order of Thelema. You will notice Alistair Crowley up there, and notice on the back of some of his followers, the hexagram. Then there was another gentleman, Dr. Gerard and Casso. He was a member of the Illuminati and he was a, um, the leader of an occult religion known as Martinism. And if you look at Albert Mackey's book, Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, he talks about Martinism. He states that the degrees of Martinism abounded in the reveries or pleasures of the mystics or those people in the occult. Dr. Theodore Russ, he was the head of the occult order known as the Ordo Templi Orientis or the OTO. And he was such a prolific occult writer that he gave the reins of authority in England over to Alistair Crowley. This gentleman here is Eliphas Levi. His true name was Alphonse Constanza. This man here was an occult writer of the 19th century. Now, many of the occult crimes that I've worked with, um, police departments, with Ted Gunderson and other investigators in the past, they have come across a common occult symbol, or picture if you would, that this occultist, this mason, was responsible for drawing. And I'm sure most of you have seen this by now. This was drawn by the hands of a mason, and it is backwards. You will notice the polarity of light with dark, and the hermaphrodite goat, done by Eliphas Levi. You notice at the very top, is a common occult symbol. It's known as a torch of illumination. This is where you gain the light of knowledge. Dr. Gerald Gardner, he started a particular movement in England. And so powerful was this movement, and so popular was it, that an entire branch of witchcraft was named after him. It became known as Gardnerian witchcraft. And um, one thing I did forget to point out, when I was in the military, unfortunately, we did succeed at getting these religions pushed 
into and accepted into the military branches throughout the world. Because by April 15th, 1970, 1978, in the Army Chaplain's Handbook on Religious Requirements, all the major occult religions were added. We are talking about Gardnerian witchcraft, Alexandrian, the first church of Satan. All these forms of the occult can now be legally practiced on any military base throughout the world. And there's nothing you can do about it because they're all federally recognized. They're all quite legal. Alex Sanders, another Mason, but also a very powerful witch himself, to which, as I just stated, he was so powerful and his movement was so powerful that they started a whole new occult religion known as Alexandrian witchcraft. He himself can be seen right here in one of his occult ceremonies. This is Alex Sanders right over here. You'll notice a familiar hexagram and this circle in this particular case represents the Tetragrammaton. The Tetragrammaton comes from the Kabbalah, but that's another story itself. <coughs> According to Albert Mackey in the um, Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, there's what's known as the Law of Salik. The Law of Salik states that no female can become a member of the Masons. Again, this is not true. There has been many cases in which this has happened in the past and recently. This lady here is Elizabeth St. Ledger. She was initiated um, 1710 when she was only 17 years old. You will notice she has the compass and the square on her King James Version of the Holy Scriptures. You will notice she has a Masonic apron on and notice the symbol of the sun. These people are sun worshippers. That's why if you ever go to a Masonic um, temple, you will see that inverted five-pointed star on the east side wall of a Masonic lodge. This is where, of course, the sun rises in the east. The lady on the left, that is Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky of the Theosophical Society. She was the one through whom a major um, trust had come about. It was known as the Lucifer Trust to her society. But for obvious reasons, this did not become popular. So they abbreviated it to Lucifer's Trust. This grandmotherly figure is Annie Passant. She was one of the people who took over, well, actually, after Alice Bailey took over, after Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, Annie Bazan took over after her. But Annie and so many other ladies, occultists, certain ones, were also Masons. You will notice, occultists, and it doesn't matter which sex, are still in the Masons. Now, assuming then that many Masons are into the occult religions, what are then the true doctrines of the Masons? In other words, what do they really believe in? According to a letter that was dated July 14, 1889, and it was penned by Giuseppe Manzini, he stated, that which we say to the crowd is this, we worship a god, but it is the god one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign grand instructed generals, now that's a 33rd degree mason, we say this. You may repeat it to the brethren of the 30th, the 31st, and the 32nd degree, that the Masonic religion should be held by all of us initiates of the high degree, 
maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. So then, according to this letter, they're saying that Lucifer is that source of light that they've been looking at. Albert Pike would agree because he states in his book, Morals and Dogma, on page 821, Lucifer, and in this case it says Lucifer, and it's all capitalized, Lucifer. Lucifer, the light bearer, is it he who bears the light? Doubt it not. Lucifer, according to their own teaching, is the source of light. We were always told it was Jesus Christ. We were also told that Lucifer, or Satan, whatever you want to call him, he's the evil god, the evil god, the black one, correct? According to what they state, the true name of Satan, the Kabbalists say, is Yahweh, or God, reversed. For Satan is not a black god, for the initiates, this is not a person, but a force, created for good, but which may serve for evil. So then, Satan is perceived to be God, the source of light then. And again, in Albert Pike's book, Morals and Dogma, on page 70, he states, To conceive of God, the Kabbalah imagined him to be a most occult light. The first three degrees of masonry, they're known as the blue degrees. You receive this at what's known as the blue lodge or the blue lodge degrees. You would think that those people um, who are entering these first three degrees, that they're told the truth of what's going on. Now you're right, they won't. <laughs> Albert Pike even put it very clearly when he stated, the blue degrees are but the outer court or portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. So these people from day one are being lied to and they're being deceived. Their own writings clearly demonstrate this. So then the next question one would have to ask oneself is, who then is allowed to know the truth of what's going on in the Masonic world? We must create a super right which will remain unknown to which we will call those Masons of high degree whom we shall select. With regard to our brothers in Masonry, these men must be pledged to the strictest secrecy. Through this supreme right, we will govern all Freemasonry, which will become the one international center, the more powerful, because its direction will remain unknown. So then, there's an outside type of Masonry, and then there is a show Masonry. In other words, Something's just being put out, and then something's being kept behind the scenes. It is this which has served as the basis for our organization of secret masonry, which is not known to, and aims which are not even so much as suspected by these chattel, attracted by us into the show army of Masonic lodges in order to throw dust in the eyes of their fellows. They also go on to state, Gentile masonry blindly serves as a screen for us and our objects. This is pure um, Illuminati doc um, doctrine we're talking now. Because the, um, the masons themselves were infiltrated by the Illuminati back on July 16th of 1782. Dr. Beishoff and Baron Adolf von Knigg convinced representatives from the 23 Supreme Councils of the Masonic world back then to follow the Illuminati towards a, towards a seven-part plan which would lead to the creation of a new world order. 
And this was not some type of clever catchphrase that George Bush came up with on September in 1990 when he stood up in front of Congress. No, the New World Order is a very old expression and it's a very old philosophy. So then if masonry is only so much show on the outside, what are they really trying to hide on the inside? We, and they're speaking of the, of the Illuminati, shall create and multiply free Masonic lodges in all the countries of the world, absorbing to them all who may become or who are prominent in public activity. For in these lodges we shall find our principal intelligence office and means of influence. All these lodges will be composed of these learned elders. The lodges will have their representatives who will serve to screen the above-mentioned administration of masonry and from whom will issue the watchword and program. The most secret political plots will be known to us and will fall under our guiding hands on the very day of their conception. You want to know why so many wealthy people, so many powerful political people, why so many intelligent individuals are brought and recruited into the Illuminati, or in this case, in the Masons? I think we already know the answer. Because through these people, their influence have multiplied in ways we can't even begin to imagine. But what's even more amazing, historically speaking, there was many, many people who were actively trying to warn America and others about what was going on in the Masonic Lodges and what was going on with the Illuminati. But how many people were listening? In a letter dated 1785 from George Washington to the Reverend G.W. Snyder, he states, Reverend Sir, it was not my intention to doubt the doctrine of the Illuminati and the principles of Jacobinism had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one is more satisfied of this fact than I am. And he was the first, matter, the first master of the Alexandrian um, Masonic Lodge. But once he found out what was going on, he left them to fight against all this. In 1798, the Reverend Jebediah Morse, who was the father of Samuel Morse, preached this um, part, of, part of a sermon. He stated, the order of the Illuminati has its branches established and its emissaries at work in America. The president of Harvard University, Joseph Willard, on July 4th, 1812, stated, there is sufficient evidence that a number of societies of the Illuminati have been established in this land. They are doubtless striving to secretly undermine all our ancient institutions, civil and sacred. These societies are clearly leagued with those of the same order in Europe. We live in an alarming period. The enemies of all order are seeking our ruin. Should infidelity generally prevail, our independence would fall, of course. Our Republican government would be annihilated. So Winston Churchill, 1920, three years after the Bolshevik Revolution had taken place and they seized, seized Russia, from the days of Spartacus Weishaupt to those of Karl Marx, to those of Trotsky, Bella Kuhn, Rosa Luxemburg, and Emma Goldman, this worldwide conspiracy has been steadily growing. This conspiracy played a definitely recognizable role in the tragedy of the French Revolution. It has been the mainspring of every subversive movement during the 19th century. And now at last, this band of extraordinary personalities from the underworld of the great cities of Europe and America have gripped the Russian people by the hair of their heads and have become practically the undisputed masters of that enormous empire. Nesta Webster in the, in the 1920s stated, while these events, she was talking about the early stages of the, of the French Revolution, were taking place in Europe, the New World, speaking of America, had been illuminized. 
As early as 1786, a lodge of the Order of the Illuminati had been started in Virginia, and this was followed by 14 others in different cities. And one of them in particular was in New York City. The governor who headed this particular um, lodge of the Illuminati was Governor DeWitt Clinton. There were some very old, old bloodlines in the Illuminati. One of my favorites, the report of the California Senate Investigating Committee on Education, 1953. So-called modern communism is apparently the same hypocritical and deadly world conspiracy to destroy civilization that was founded by the secret order of the Illuminati in Bavaria on May 1st, 1776, and that raised its hoary head in our colonies here at the critical period before the adoption of our federal constitution. This was back in 1953, not too far away. Time and time again, people have been trying to warn others about what has really been going on in this world. That there is a conspiracy and that this conspiracy is headed by those people who are following Lucifer. These people are known as the Illuminati. They have their puppets and front men throughout the world. And unfortunately, with the Masons, as I stated before, 95% of them have been duped. They've been lied to. Uh, most of them, they have been trying to do a good work. They really have been. Think of the Shriners hospitals, Shriners burn centers, the Shriners circuses. So many of them are trying to do a good work, but they have been lied to. They have been used as front people for over 200 years now. And what's interesting, do you know most of them have never read any of their own books from cover to cover? I'll tell you right now, if they really did, and if they would just read some of the stuff we have just gone over, I believe they would begin to understand that they have been lied to, and that they have been used. Personally speaking, those Masons who do get out, I get a lot of my Masonic books from them. I, they just hand over their um, Masonic books that they've gathered over the years they give to me. This way I can sit down, I can pour through it, and I can keep on revealing more truths to these people, so Lord willing, they'll be able to get saved and get free from what Satan has shackled them with especially those people who are stuck in the Illuminati. Those are the most deceived people upon the face of the earth. They are told there is no way out. You try to get out, you will be killed. And the truth is, yes, I'll tell you right now, if you leave the order of the Illuminati, within 24 hours they have nothing less than a $10,000 bounty placed on your neck to anyone in the Illuminati who can collect it. They don't care how, just so long as you execute the person. Now in my case, I, I lost count after 20-something different death attempts. You just lose count after a while. I mean, I've been shot at, I've been poisoned, they've tried to run me over. They have, according to the last person we got, got out, um, a half a million dollar bounty out of my neck. Oh, but I'm not worried. I'm not worried, I've got nothing to worry about. I mean, think about this. God has infinite foreknowledge. He knows the exact split second of time somewhere down this road that I'm going to um, die or I'm going to be called up in the rapture. Now, no matter how powerful Lucifer or his cronies in the Illuminati believe they are, no matter how strong they think they are, they cannot alter what God has already foreseen one second more or less. So why should I get a gray hair? And what really amuses me about all this, and actually you do um, 
take on this type of mentality afterwards because either you're going to laugh about it or you're going to cry about it. Um, what are they doing to me? What are they threatening me with? God? Now, wait a second. Um, you're going to hold a gun to my head and said, you're either going to give up what you're doing or I'm going to send you to God. <laughs> hold on. Let me come back in a, in a couple of minutes. Let me think this one through. <laughs> this is ridiculous. If they think that they are going to threaten me, Especially at this point, um, at this point in my life, they are out of their minds. You know, and we have to remember, ladies and gentlemen, the same goes with each and every single one of you here. One of the one things that breaks my heart is when I have, and I personally have seen, pastors, associate pastors, Christians who won't even put one finger on an occult book. This is not the Ark of the Covenant. It's not going to kill you. You know? You don't have to be a, Le a Levitical priest to pick it up. But we are so paralyzed with fear. And this doesn't make sense. I thought fear was of Satan and not of God. Well then, why are we afraid? More people tell me do you know what these people do? Do, do, do you know who they're worshipping? Do, do, do you know what those witches and... Well, yes, I have a pretty good idea. <laughs> but it doesn't make sense to me. Why should we be afraid of those people who are worshipping our defeated enemy? Where am I missing the boat in all this? Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just getting old. In order to understand the order of the Illuminati, you have to look at it from three perspectives. It's not one single thing. If anyone says one thing defines the Illuminati, forget it. You have to understand their religion, their politics, and their finances. I think when we say finances, I, if I just say the name Rothschild, that should be sufficient. But of course, there's some other old bloodlines with a lot of old and dirty money. Rockefellers. Kennedys. DuPont. The Onassis. There's a lot of old, old dirty money that goes back into all this. When we look at the occult part of all this, we have to go back all the way to about 3,500 BC, the Tower of Babel. Now we all know that basically at the end of the great Noahic flood, Noah, Mrs. Noah, well I didn't know her name, Shem, Ham, Japheth, their wives, all of them got off the ark and all the animals got off with them. Now the problem was, the animals were multiplying faster than the human beings. This was a problem because you see, these were no longer the friendly, docile, will pet the lion type animals. The curse had already hit the face of the earth. The Garden of Eden was already over. These were man-hunting, flesh-eating creatures. Someone had to come up with an answer because we were on the bottom of the food chain. We became the endangered species. Well, this is where Nimrod comes into play. You read scriptures, you'll find out that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. But what most people don't realize, you see, this is an old English word. And I'm an old English person, so I can tell you that. The word before means against. Nimrod was not a mighty hunter for God. He was a mighty hunter against God. So you find out that in the occult world, um, the um, male god, or who's known as 
you know, that part of the um, aspect of, the, um, of witchcraft. He's referred to as the god of the hunt or the stag god. Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's how he became known as the god of the hunt or the stag god, among other names. He and his mother, Semiramis, came up with a brilliant idea. They, built, they had a city built and they had it walled in. This was the very first walled city in man's history. It was known as Babylon. Seven others came about because of it. You'll find out that in the Bible it says, and this was the beginning of his kingdom. Now obviously, if this was his kingdom, he must be the king. And he was. His mother, Semiramis, was the queen. What no one realized back then at first is that through Semiramis and Nimrod, the occult religion was started. This is where we get the occult, is from these two people. They co-founded this religion. Nimrod's uncle Shem found out about this. He took Nimrod outside of the city of Babylon and killed him. He chopped his body into little parts and dispersed those throughout the other cities as a warning to anyone else who would ever dare to mock God in this fashion. This was not going to be tolerated. You don't mock God like this. Semiramis, being the smart cookie that she was, took the occult religion and pushed it underground. Now to put this as gently as possible, just to show you how sick Nimrod and his mother were, and again, I'm going to say this as gently as possible. They were sharing the same bedroom. Now while she was underground, Semiramis had her son Nimrod elevated to God status. He became, as I just stated, the god of the hunt or the stag god. His symbol is the five-pointed star. Semiramis obviously then must be a goddess. Her symbol was the crescent moon. Whenever you see the crescent moon and the star together, it's the symbol of the co-founders of the occult religion. While she was underground, she had her priests and priestesses, she told them that she was having, get this, an immaculate conception. She was having a baby without sexual intercourse. Now this was not going to be any ordinary baby, you see, this was going to be Nimrod come back in another form. Their God was going to come back to life. And you see, this is where reincarnation began. You don't die and go to heaven or hell. You come back in another form. This other form that Nimrod supposedly came back into was known as Temuz. You will, as a matter of fact, find mention of Tammuz in Ezekiel 8.14. We'll get to that in a second. But Tammuz, he was nowhere near as good a hunter as his father was because when he was 40 years old, while he was hunting, a wild boar had killed him. The dead god had gone back to the underworld again. Now, in Ezekiel 8.14, there's an interesting event going on. God has shown Ezekiel certain things that's going on in his own house, in the very temple of God himself. One of those events that was going on was there was these women weeping and wailing and fasting over the death of their god, Tammuz. Now, occultically speaking, the tradition states that there's a 40-day period in which you fast, you cry, you pray, and you give things up because of the death of Tammuz. This is where the Catholic got Lent from. Lent is a 40-day period, and every single one of those days represents one of the years of Tammuz's life. And there's a lot more to this. There really is. I mean, come on, people. Think about this. What does an Easter bunny and the Easter egg have to do with the resurrection of Christ? I mean, either I failed my theology classes or something occultically is going on here that we just haven't been told about. And you will find out, and I will say this in, this is not a popular statement, but then again, the truth never has been popular today. 
And again, I really feel sorry for those um, Catholic people because like so many other people, they've been lied to. They've been deceived. Catholicism is based purely on the occult religions. I can prove this. I've done it in books before. If you compare um, the Catholic belief system, the Catholic mass, everything about it, you're going to find out it's one and the same thing. There was no difference. There is no difference. I mean, I could, um, when I was in the occult, I could walk into a Catholic mass and feel right at home. And this was an illuminist at the time. It's unfortunate, but this is true. Now, um, at the Great Dispersion at the Tower of Babylon, it didn't end, it didn't end there. I mean, come on, common sense tells us these people, when they spread abroad throughout the world, did they forget their occult religion? Of course not. They took it with them. This is how it got spread all the way through um, Asia, through North America, through Great Britain, um, India alone. I know missionaries that are going crazy because those people are worshipping over 300 million gods. I mean, they, they have a God for everything. They can't live without a God. A God of the paper, a God of the pulpit, a God of the flowers. Paul was going crazy also because remember, when he was in Greece, as he was walking down the roads, there was more gods, and just in case someone forgot one, there was the unknown God. I mean, you want to talk about, you know, walking on eggshells. But anyways, um... Along the line, um, when we get into Egypt, and I'm going to pick this part of the story up fast, Moses is, is in um, the story now. Moses, for the first 40 years of his life, was raised with a gold spoon in his mouth. Let's face it, this guy um, was the adopted son of the daughter of Pharaoh Ramses I. We believe Pharaoh Ramses II um, was the Pharaoh during Moses' time. And it's very possible Moses could have become the next Pharaoh had he not killed an Egyptian. While he was growing up, Moses was taught art, architect, literature, the sciences, mathematics, engineering, and for 40 years, the occult religion of Egypt. He was in and out of the temples of Moloch like all the other followers. He messes up, he kills an Egyptian, he has to get out of there, he's no exception. This is the version of the death sentence I like. You kill someone, that's it. I can't help but say to myself, why should I have to pay for the next 60 years for you to live in the Holiday Hilton? You know, maybe I'm just old fashioned. But anyways, Moses, to make a very long story short, gets out of there, runs to the land of Midian, runs into Jephthah, a very wealthy um, priest of, um, Judaism, who's making good money in the cattle industry. Um, he has many daughters, he also has many sheep, but um, one of the daughters was named Zipporah. Zipporah meets Moses, Moses meets Zipporah. They like each other, they get married. It was a Jewish wedding. Anyway, so for the next 40 years, Moses is out there tending to the sheep, learning all of Midian, the land and everything. And it was no accident he went to Midian. He thinks he ran there, but God sort of directed him because in order to get to the mountains of Sinai and to the Promised Land, you have to first go through Midian. Midian is a vast area, and if you're going to take about two and a half million Jewish people with you, it better be a big area. While he's there, a sheep gets lost and ends up on the top of Mount Sinai. Moses goes follow it, tries to get it like the good shepherd is, and lo and behold, it was a burning bush. Now this would get anyone's attention, especially if it was talking to you. <laughs> Moses, this is God. Take your sandals off. This is holy ground. I've got a job for you. Moses, you're going to go down to the um, land of Egypt where Pharaoh sits and you're going to take the entire workforce and get out of there. Do you know Moses was not into this? You read the scriptures very carefully, five times Moses was trying to worm himself out of it. One of my favorite times is that, but God, 
I'm a lousy speaker and I have a slow tongue. I just wait a second. If you read over in the book of Acts, Luke was saying that Moses was a great orator and a man of mighty words. Now, doesn't this sound like Moses? Moses was just about this far away from lying. Now, come on, people. Don't you think by now? We have sanctified and glorified and elevated these people to where they're no longer human. And that's all they were. These dear brothers and sisters of ours in the past were no different than any single one of you, except for one single thing. The level of their commitment, of their faith. That's the only difference. Any single one of you is capable of doing a lot better than what they did back then. It's true. Even Christ himself said, greater deeds are you going to be able to do. And why not? Because all power and authority was given unto you in heaven. Every single one of you in this room have that power. So why aren't we exercising it? Moses is really badgering God about this. Finally, Moses says, can you please send someone with me? Okay, take Aaron. Now, <laughs> Aaron was psyched for this. I mean, come on. God says to Moses, okay, this is what you're going to be able to do. You can take the staff, turn it into a snake. You can take the water, strike it, turn to blood. You can call the frogs out. You can take your hand, stick it in your pocket. Look, it's leprosy, and the hand is quick, quicker than the eye. Look, it's gone. This got Aaron's attention. He was psyched to go. Moses was not. Moses was not in the least bit impressed. And you're going to find out why. Now, I mean, come on. Any single one of us that right now that saw a staff turned into a snake or the water turned to blood, I mean, this would be wow. Okay. They go down to um, Egypt and they're about to do their thing. Pharaoh, on the other hand, you have to look at Pharaoh. Pharaoh is considered the God king upon the face of the earth. Pharaoh, owner of everything he could possibly see. Pharaoh was having these huge monuments, these cities, the sphinx, the pyramids built after him. When he was being raised as a little boy, he had everything he could possibly imagine. If he wanted to go from point A to point B, he didn't have to walk. They would carry him in a litter, bring him in a chariot, or put him on a horse and bring him to wherever he wanted to go. He would be decked out in the finest clothes, the best jewelry, the greatest gold, things like that. He's sitting at his temple, and suddenly Moses decides to show up. So basically, Moses and Aaron, they go down to meet Pharaoh. Now if you remember, Pharaoh literally owns everything. This guy was raised up with a gold spoon in his mouth. All these monuments, everything was dedicated in his name. And here comes Moses and Aaron. Moses is 80 years old. Aaron is 81. So these two senior citizens walk into the middle of this glorious, magnificent palace, smelling like sheep, badly needing tailors, and they walk up to Pharaoh and say, we're going to take the entire workforce of Egypt. And you're going to agree? Do you really think Pharaoh was going to just say, okay, go ahead, take them all. Forget about the building projects. Pharaoh did not agree. Aaron, take your staff, turn it into the serpent. He takes it, throws it on the step, it becomes a serpent. It's a good trick. How many of you have seen the Ten Commandments? Now, come on, you got to admit, that was good stuff. It wasn't accurate, but it was good stuff, especially the parting of the Red Sea. We'll never forget that one. You know, that was done, by the way, in a bathtub filled with red jello. You know, it's true. But anyway, so the serpent is crawling up the steps. 
Pharaoh didn't bat an eye. He calls his occult magicians over. They take their staffs, they duplicate the exact same miracle. Or at least it appears to be that they're duplicating the miracles of God. You're going to find out something very unusual was really going on here. Basically, Pharaoh tells Moses and Aaron, get out of here. Well, they go regroup. They talk to God. God says, listen, Pharaoh's going to be down the, by the rivers tomorrow morning. You go down there. If he doesn't listen, turn the water into blood. Well, sure enough, he goes down there. Pharaoh sees him coming. Pharaoh's going, oh, not these people again. Sort of like, you know, Christians, you know. <laughs> these Christians who just keep showing up and keep showing up, people eventually go, oh, not them again. But anyways, well, you, you, you'll wear them down eventually, trust me. But anyways, um, Moses says, Pharaoh, you've got to let them go. Pharaoh goes, why? Well, because God said so. This caught his attention. Remember, the Egyptians were polytheistic. They believed in many gods. So Pharaoh goes, well, what god? Well, the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Never heard of him. Okay, Aaron, turn the water into blood. He does it. The Nile is just being filled with blood. Pharaoh was not impressed. He calls his occult buddies over. They take their staves. They hit the water, and the water turns into blood. Should Pharaoh have been impressed? Nope. He turns around with his entourage and they just leave. About a week later, Moses comes back with Aaron. Pharaoh, you've got to listen to me. Let the children go. Moses, you don't understand. Aaron, take your staff, do your thing. It's the water, the frogs are coming out of the rivers. They're going everywhere. They're in the bathroom. They're in the living room. They're in the game room. They're in the TV room. They're in every room in the house imaginable. Fell in a bat and I called his friends over. They called the frogs out of the water also. Something obviously is going on here that I think we've been missing. First of all, should Pharaoh have been impressed? Not in your wildest imagination. Pharaoh was not supposed to be impressed. You see, if you read the scriptures, it, all, it says that God had already hardened Pharaoh's heart. You don't harden someone's heart and expect to impress them. Well, was Moses the one? Moses was trying to get out of this. I don't think he was, imp he was not impressed in the least. Aaron was, but not Moses. Well, then if it's not Moses, and if it's not Pharaoh, who was it God was trying to impress? How about his children? They've been stuck in an occult society for 400 years. He had to get their attention. So there was a problem here. When these miracles were being duplicated, it looked like they were duplicating the miracles of God, right? No. They don't have that type of power. God was duplicating their powers. He was doing it for a three-part reason. The psychology was flawless. Well, it had to be his God. First of all, the serpent, the water into blood, and the frogs were done to prove that I can do anything these people can do. The next six plagues God did to show I can outdo anything these people think that they can come up with. And if you read the scriptures, the occult magicians were saying, this is the hand of the God. And the last one, where he took the firstborn of all the Egyptians was to prove his sovereignty over Pharaoh, his sovereignty over the world, and that he is indeed the God over life and death. This got his children's attention. All this happened simply because nowadays we have a similar problem going on. The world is literally being taken over by occult means. You read um, the prophecy found in Revelation 18.23b, the world is going to be taken over. Every single nation, 
through the occult and hand it over to the Antichrist. It's right there. What we have to ask ourselves is what are we going to be, what are we going to do about this? Are we going to stay in our comfort zones, go through the motions, and pretend as if we're suffering for the Lord? You know, it's, a one, it's one thing, and I can speak to you people, you're my brothers and sisters. It's one thing to take the title. It's another thing to live it. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> You know. Now I know a lot of people because of health or because of age, they can't get out there and do anything like they used to. But I'll tell you right now, those people are some of the greatest prayer warriors I have ever met. These people could, could pray down a pillar of fire. You know? Every single one of you have the ability to walk up to these people, and these are the least two witness people on the face of the earth. So many people over the years have told me, well, the Jewish people are the least witness to people. Well, let me tell you, if I wanted to go witness to a Jewish person, I'd go to a synagogue. I'd go to a temple, and let me tell you, I can still bench with the best of them. Or if I wanted to go witness to a Catholic, let's go down to the nearest Catholic church. But where do you go if you want to witness to an Illuminist? Where would you go if you wanted to witness to a Satanist or to a witch? Do you know how to properly witness to them? Because I'll tell you right now, one method when you witness to the witches, it's never going to work with Satanists, and it's certainly not going to um, go with the Illuminists. There are eight major occult groups in America, and every single one of them demands a different way of witnessing. It's the same thing like when you witness to the Mormons, it's not going to work the same way as um, if you witness to, to a Jehovah Witness. You have to know their belief. You have to know their philosophy, their religion. You have to know what they're about. But if we're too afraid just to touch one of their books, how are we ever going to win these poor lost souls to Christ? Literally hundreds and thousands of these people are dying every day. The only ones that can make a difference, the only ones that can pull them out of their situation are you people here and every single one else in our family. We're the only ones. When Christ said, ye are supposed to be the light of the world, he wasn't kidding. How else are these people who are trapped in darkness going to see your light unless you're holding it up for them to see? Just think about this. This next section we're going to get into the seven-part plan of the Illuminati. Everything they're doing was formulated back, well, it first began in 1773 by Dr. Adam Weishaupt. He himself came up with a seven-part plan to take over everything. Starting at the top, he called for the abolition of all old government, of private pro property, inheritance, patriotism, religion, the family, and the last one, in his own words, the creation of a new world order. We're going to use an Illuminati document. Let me just get it. There is a coded Illuminati document that too many people have been thinking it's something else. I've been told over the years that all this is nothing but some type of Jewish Zionist conspiracy. And let me tell you, that's absolutely nonsense. What was it? Um, April of 1995, Reader's Digest, once again, was talking about the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, stating this proves a Jewish Zionist conspiracy. Well, those people at um, Reader's Digest obviously don't know what they're talking about. Because that particular document, um, which was translated into English in 1922 by Victor Marsden, 
What um, Victor Marsden did not realize, nor anyone else, was that the Protocols was a coded Illuminati document. Unless you know how to translate the Illuminati's codes, just like any of the Masonic books, you've, if you've ever seen a lot of them, they're written in a code. Unless you know how to translate these codes, you'll never, never be able to read the document for what it really is. And according to my friends, this is the only 1922 first edition of the Protocols in existence. This I can tell you right now, I've read it, I've written a book about it. This is a true coded Illuminati document. And what we're going to do, using this document, we're going to go and examine the Illuminati's seven-part plan for a global conquest and then see if this document represents a Zionist conspiracy or an Illuminati one. The first thing they call for is the abolition of all ordered government. How they plan to do this. If you would, just read along with me. Political freedom is an idea, but not a fact. This idea, one must know how to apply whenever it appears necessary with this bait of an idea to attract the masses of the peoples to one's party for the purpose of crushing another who is in authority. Why do you think we are a two-public, um, excuse me, two-party system now? Republican, Democrat. You know this used to be a one-party system? In theory. I'm still waiting for the actuality of all this. <laughs> whether a state exhausts itself in its own convulsions, whether it, excuse me, whether its internal discord brings it under the power of external foes, in any case, it can be accounted irretrievably lost. It is in our power. In any state in which there is a bad organization of authority and in personality of laws and of the rulers who have lost their personality amid the flood of rights ever multiplying out of liberalism, I find a new right to attack by the right of the strong and to scatter to the winds all existing forces of order and regulation, to reconstruct all institutions and to become the sovereign lord of those who have left to us the rights of their power by laying them down voluntarily in their liberalism. The Constitution scale of these days will shortly break down, for we have established them with a certain lack of accurate balance in order that they may oscillate incessantly until they wear through the pivot on which they turn. Why do you think your Constitution just isn't working? And they are planning a new one. We will get to that. Speaking of the President. He will have the right to propose temporary laws and even new departures in the government constitution. I'm sure by now we've heard of executive orders. How do you think they're doing it? When we introduce into the state organism the poison of liberalism, its whole political complexion underwent a change. States have been seized with a mortal illness, blood poisoning. All that remains is to await the end of their death agony. Why do you think liberalism was introduced into our system? It keeps so many arguments and so much fighting going on. It keeps us from being able to spend our time and attention on what is the true agendas. Useless changes of forms of governments to which we instigated the channel when we were undermining their state structures will have so wearied the peoples by that time that they will prefer to suffer anything under us rather than run the risk of enduring again all the agitations and miseries they have gone through. They're going to weigh you down. And you know what the thing is? Most people will be willing to accept peace at any price.
While preaching liberalism to the chattel, we at the same time keep our own people and our agents in a state of unquestioning submission. And I'll swear to that. Because if I didn't do exactly what they told me to do, they would have buried me a long time ago. You do exactly what these people tell you to do. But as a Christian, of course, I, I don't listen to them anymore. <laughs> And neither should any of us. Come on. Nor their devices, nor any of their flunkies. But our power in the present tottering condition of all forms of power will be more invincible than any other because it will remain invisible until the moment when it has gained such strength that no cunning can any longer undermine it. Why do you think we call it the invisible government? This, then, is the program of the new Constitution. We shall make law, right, and justice in the guise of proposals to the legislative cause, by the decrees of the President under the guise of general regulations, of orders of the State of the Senate, and of resolutions of the State Council in the guise of ministerial orders, and in case a suitable occasion should arise, in the form of a revolution in the State. They are going to um, have martial law declared. This is part of their plans. The only um, thing is, um, most people ask me, when is it going to happen? All I can tell you is right now, it's, 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 a lot, it's a lot closer than what most people are imagining. It is going to happen soon, that's for sure. The abolition of all ordered government. How do they plan to do it? Through party dissension, liberalism, and an imbalanced constitution. And I think they've been succeeding at that, haven't they? Why? According to their own writing, so a new constitution may replace the old one. Right now, one of the leading advocates for a constitutional convention, the biggest one, what is his name? It just went through my mind. <laughs> Ross Perot, thank you. If they get their way, your constitution isn't going to be worth the paper it's written on. Not that it's really being observed anyways, but at least now it'll be legal. The second part of their plan called for the abolition of all private property. Listen how they plan to do this one. We shall create by all the secret subterranean methods open to us and with the aid of gold, which is all in our hands, a universal economic crisis whereby we shall throw upon the streets whole mobs of workers simultaneously in all the countries of Europe. These mobs will rush delightedly to shed the blood of those whom, in the simplicity of their ignorance, they have envied from their cradles and whose property they will then be able to loot. It is essential, therefore, for us, at whatever cost, to deprive them of their land. This object will be best attained by increasing the burdens upon landed property In loading lands with debts. These measures will check land holding and keep it in a state of humble and unconditional submission. Why do you think you people are being taxed to death? Why do you think the federal government have been taking away all the parks away? Why do you think they've been literally bankrupting the farmers? Why do you think they have that expression, eminent domain? 
They plan to take away everyone's private property. Because if you don't own it, well, you're not the, uh, you've got to answer to someone, and that's the landlord. And in this case, it would be the government or the Illuminati. How do they intend to abolish private property through bribery, deceit, treachery, and an economic crisis? Why? To secure submission and sovereignty. You know, if I could control what you could buy or what you could sell, I've got you exactly where I want you. You can't do anything without my permission. But we're going to get into this. I think we all know what I'm talking about. Abolition of inheritance. How do they intend to get rid of inheritance? The rich must be aware that it is their duty to place a part of their superfluities at the disposal of the state since the state guarantees them security of possession of the rest of their property and the right of honest gains. I say honest, for the control over property will do away with robbery on a legal basis. Mm-hmm. Therefore, we must not stop at bribery, deceit, and treachery when they should serve towards the attainment of our end. In politics, one must know how to seize the property of others without hesitation, if by it we secure submission and sovereignty. So that's what the political game is, is all about. Purchase, receipt of money or inheritance will be subject to the payment of a stamped progressive tax. Any transfer of property, whether money or other, without evidence of payment of this tax, which will be strictly registered by names, will render the former holder liable to pay interest on the tax from the moment of transfer of these sums up to the discovery of his evasion of declaration of the transfer. Try to get away with it. This next one is about, is one of my favorite ones on this part. Just strike an estimate of how many times such taxes as these will cover the revenue of the chattel states. Do you realize if any of you have a piece of property that you want to leave behind to someone, let's say you have to pay $5,000 worth of taxes on it. Well, you've worked hard to pay um, for that land. You paid taxes on it every year. You give that over to the person, and upon your death, it becomes their property. Well, do you know, after all that um, sweat and toil that you um, put into acquiring this, they now have to put in an additional $5,000 worth of taxes. And after they die and they give it to someone, they're going to have to pay $5,000 worth of taxes. And this is going to go on and on and on, non-stop. This is why they have these crazy taxes. Simply because they have got you on a merry-go-round that you cannot get off of. How do they intend to abolish inheritance? Through unfair high burden of taxes. Why? To take away your revenue. Do you know most people would never be able to pay those taxes? Especially if, you know, um, if it's not a time payable type of tax. Those people are going to have to forfeit their land or whatever property they have to Big Brother. And I mean, it, trust me, they do it in a split and in a split second, they've already done it to all our, to how many parks is it now? 47, I think we've lost to them. I think it's something like that. And they're just going to keep taking and keep taking and keep taking until it's all theirs. Unless, of course, we start, you know, sounding the warning um, horn and start getting everyone's attention. Because I'll grant you, a small group of people, well, we can't do a thing. But I think if we got everyone backing us, behind us, I think the government would be in for the surprise of their life. Abolition of all patriotism. 
how um, did Dr. Adam Weishaupt write about this one? It is with this object in view that we are constantly by means <laughs> arising a blind confidence in these theories which our agent specialists have cunningly pieced together for the purpose of educating their minds in the direction we want. Do not suppose for a moment that these statements are empty words. Think carefully of the successes we arranged for Darwinism, Marxism, and Nietzscheism. They openly admit to being the authors to the success of these ideologies. And they will also, and you'll eventually find out, the people who caused the French Revolution and all other uh, major wars. But once they brought in Darwinism, this is where we really started taking a beating. Listen to this next one carefully. We appear on the scene as alleged saviors of the worker from this oppression when we propose to him to enter the ranks of our fighting forces, socialists, anarchists, communists. This is who their um, fighting forces are made up of. They were the ones who started all these to begin with. Communism, if you just compare it to the Illuminati's belief system, is exactly the same thing. Don't think for a moment that in, um, what was it, 1848, in Soho, London, when Karl Marx was sitting down and having coffee, don't think suddenly the light of brilliancy struck him. It didn't. All he did was plagiarize the seven-part plan of the Illuminati for the creation of a new world order. And if you take his Communist Manifesto and compare it to what you're looking at right now, you're going to see most of it is a verbatim um, plagiarized work. How do they plan to abolish patriotism? by introducing the introduction of Marxism, Darwinism, Nietzscheism, Socialism, Anarchism, Darwinism, you name it. If it could be used to destroy patriotism, they brought it in. Why? These doctrines would again help lead to the destruction of all of us. How many of you remember when you were younger? Old Glory would be flown in a parade down Main Street, Men would take off their hat, old veterans would be saluting, you'd see a tear trickling down a lady's uh, um, face, children would be dead silent. And now we've got some type of law that states we can burn the symbol of America. 